from FingerLakes1.com, this is Inside the FLX. I'm Josh Durso, and today we're talking with the man who was enthusiastically chosen as Canandaigua City Manager this past summer, John Goodwin, who landed in the city in 2014, was unanimously selected for the post by City Council. He joins us to talk about his new gig, uh, experience around the state, and some of the exciting things happening in the city. Uh, Thank you for being here today, John. Thanks for having me, Josh. So uh, tell us a little bit about how you uh, got involved with... uh, this whole city planning thing and what jump started it for you? What was the thing that was like, wow, this is what I really want to do? Uh, well, there was a, a show that was really popular when I was growing up called The West Wing. Um, and uh, that show made me fall in love with the idea of government and the idea that um, it can affect change. Um, there, there was a quote that uh, Leo McGarry, who was the chief of staff in that show, had that says, you know, in a single day, we have the power to affect more change than some people can in a lifetime. Um, and that just really resonated with me. Uh, so I always wanted to go into public service. I think most people, you know, I think mostly because of that show and maybe also from the influence of my parents and watching it with them and uh, all the public service things that they did. Um, uh, you know, so I always wanted to do something in government. And I, I, so I, I'm thinking, all right, well, maybe I'll go the political route. And I took an internship with the assembly. Um, and, uh, you know, even though I had a great time and worked for a, a wonderful assemblyman, I, um, it just, there was, just wasn't, it didn't, wasn't right for me. Um, and I uh, ended up meeting a professor, uh, Bob McAvoy, um, who was more than a professor. He's a former Schenectady County manager uh, and a couple of uh, managing, managing municipalities down in Westchester communities. Um, and he brought me the idea of public administration and uh, professional management. Um, ICMA, which I'd never heard of, um, and you know, in a lot of northeastern um, communities, they, they're not, they're a strong mayor form of government, and, and you know, you're not really familiar with it. Um, mm-hmm. And so, the more more I learned about it, well, I'll wait, they, you know, the community hires uh, somebody that's trained to run uh, a, a government. That just makes sense. And um, so, I, I got my master's in public administration from SUNY Albany, and. Um, which, by the way, at the time uh, was the second rate, second highest in the in the country for local government management, um, behind Syracuse and above Harvard. So, um, I always like to tout the SUNY programs <laughs> when I can because yeah. you know, there are some great programs for our SUNY schools that um, don't get enough uh, press. So, uh, obviously, uh, your roots now. You're planning your roots right in Canandaigua. Um, a little bit about that sort of background and what your experience has been like so far in Canandaigua. Uh, well, I, I moved up to Canandaigua uh, you know, probably because what most people move to Canandaigua for or stay in Canandaigua for is it's just it's a beautiful community. Um, and it's a wonderful, wonderful people that care deeply for the community. Um, and you know, it's a good school district and wonderful people, um, uh, great restaurants. Uh, um, and, of course, the, there's Canandaigua Lake um, and, you know, and I bet you, you know, anybody who lives in a municipality along one of the, the Finger Lakes could say, you know, this is why I'm here. Um, and, that, and that's definitely one of the reasons why, why we're in Canandaigua. And, um, you know, my family and I absolutely love it. So you were doing, you had served as the acting city manager for a period, uh, went back to the assistant role, then jumped back in again. Uh, then you're named city manager. That The day you were named, or I suppose the day after you were named uh city manager uh, this summer, what what were some of the priorities or what were some of the things you're like, okay, this is what I want to do? Uh, well, we, 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 as assistant city manager, I was able to do a lot of the, the things that you know, we wanted to get there. But um, as, as a city manager, you don't just say, hey, well, this is the direction we're going. Uh, we, you know, we work with our city council. Yep. Uh, city council uh, creates the policy um, and it's the manager's role to do the day-to-day administration. Um, you know, I, I do make recommendations and uh, for projects and things that you know, I think will help the city move in the direction that uh, is, is for the overall good. Um, one example is uh, we installed uh, a large solar array project, which uh, reduced our, our carbon footprint by 80% for our city facilities and um, covers uh, 94% of the electricity for all of our city facilities. Um, yeah, you know, so that's a project that I that I worked on and, and recommended, and, and council agreed and, and, and went with. But um, and and we're continuing to move in that in that sort of vein, um, looking at projects that um, you know aren't necessarily uh, you know, the big sexy projects, but are good for the city overall. Um, 
for example, that solar project we were able to do without spending a single dime of taxpayer funds, mm -hmm. and it's going to save us, you know, millions of dollars over the next 25 years. Um, so, yeah, and, and we're also a green, sustainable community. Um, so, you know, things like that and um, looking for things like that. Since you mentioned it, how, how important is it for municipalities to start thinking that way in terms of what they can do to reduce that carbon footprint, to be more green just at, out of being proactive? Well, I think it's got to make sense. Um, you, we, can, we can go green and spend a lot of money doing it. Um, but if it doesn't make sense for the community, it's not going to work. Um, so I think we, any municipality has got to look for ways to do things more efficiently, um, more effectively, um, because I think our biggest challenge is, um, you know, not overburdening the property tax payer, um, providing the quality of life and the, and the high quality level of services that, that people expect and desire, um, and doing it in the most effective manner we can. Um, so, you know, that, for example, that solar project, it made sense not only environmentally but fiscally. Um, uh, you know, so you have to look for those opportunities, um, whether it's for green initiatives or, or anything else. Um, so, but, you know, uh, for our community our size uh, in Canandaigua to be um, nearly 100% uh, green for our city facilities in terms of electricity, I think it's very it's something we should be very proud about. And, um, and we, we're actually continuing to move in that vein with some other projects. And um, we were, we're you know, like like the city of Geneva is going through now. We're planning to purchase all of our street lights, um, and convert them all to LEDs uh, through a performance contract. Um, and we're also looking to you know we have a, a water treatment uh, plant. So we're pumping millions of gallons out of Canandaigua Lake every day. Um, you know, but you know, why can't we put some heat exchangers on it, and make it like a mini geothermal system, um, which is an idea that you know would. I don't think a lot of municipalities you know, think about, but you know, see, and and we're going to do it. Um, so, um, and we're going to do it under a performance contract without costing uh, the city money, but then we'll have long-term savings. So, that, you know, you always have to look for those opportunities. How how much of a challenge is the the balancing act between the service and the cost? How much of a, a daily grind is that really like? making sure that the numbers crunch right and ensuring that the taxpayers aren't hit even now or down the road? Well, that, that's the biggest challenge that any municipality has, uh, especially in the, the New York State tax cap environment uh, where non-property tax revenue is stagnant or declining. Um, you know, so the only real lever you have is the property tax. Um, and, you know, and But people still want the, the same level of services. They still want their streets plowed and the, uh, they still want the potholes filled and their parks to be uh, in top shape. Uh, they want the fire department to come to their, uh, their house when, when they need it and the same thing with the police. Um, it, it, in order to do that, you know, it costs money to, to employ people and people need raises and, um, and then the cost of living, as everyone knows, always increases and that increases for us as well. Um, so it, it's a huge challenge. Um, it, but so we're always looking for ways to do things better, more efficiently. Um, and you know, sometimes uh, we're able to do it, and sometimes we, we, you know, we, we've got to ask for a little bit more. Um, and, but it, that's the, a battle that um, every municipality uh, fights every year and every day. Now, what do you hear in terms of when, as far as from the, the people who live in Canada, what do you hear as far as what, the, what they want to see uh, the city sort of evolve into and continue growing into. Obviously, everyone wants to see economic development, but anything else other than that besides just sort of the day-to-day -day things, improving our roads I and mean, that sort of thing? Well, I think uh, we have a very high quality of life in, in Canandaigua, and I think in generally people are, are, are happy and, and love living in Canandaigua. Um, but, you know, and one of the things that, that I recommended to city council and that they're, they move forward with, with the, in the 2018 budget um, is to redo our strategic plan. Um, and to do that, uh, we're going to do a, a National Research Center uh, National Citizen Survey um, and really get some scientific data by asking our residents, uh, what do we do well, what don't we do well, what do you want us to do, do better, um, or, or, and really get uh, you know, some participation. Um, you know, one of our core values is responsive participatory governance, um, and we truly mean it. Um, and you can't really get that by just going on uh, social media or listening to people that attend meetings because they're, they're two different, sometimes it can be two different uh, you know, opinions and it might not actually be the sentiment of the community. 
So we're going to try to our best to get that sediment by doing that survey and then basing our strategic plan around it. Um, and then we'll have you know documented scientifically pro proof of what the community sediment is. And it's not a very large portion. Statistically, it's not a very large part. The engaged part, the people who are speaking openly and talking of it, is still a very small percentage of the whole community. Um, obviously, that's got to be the biggest challenge you guys face day in and day out is just trying to get everyone involved, right? Well, you know, it, it, it can be disheartening sometimes when, when you see one person sitting in, in front of you. Um, but at the same time, that might also be an indication you're doing your job right, right. Um, because people are generally happy. And, and um, But <coughs> you know, everyone's lives is, is, are very busy, and it's hard to, you know, for even even government officials to attend every meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that we understand that, and we try to get participation as much as we can. Um, but that's why council, city council is out there when they run for election. They're knocking on doors, and they and they live in the community, and they represent the people, uh, and they they have friends that they talk to, or, or people come up to them. Um, so you know, participation in government is not just you know coming to a meeting. Um, it's sending emails. It's you know talking to your council member. It's calling me or and. Um, or what have you. Uh, so we, we do have, I think, a, an active participation, um, but you, you're only going to participate when you when you need to. Um, I, I had an old boss in, in Scarsdale who said, you know you're doing your job when the phone doesn't ring. Because uh, many times we have a, a thankless job. So we, we, if the water turns on in the morning and the, the toilet flushes and the garbage is picked up, there's no reason, to, to, no reason to call your government, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, and that means we're doing good. So... So uh, a couple of minutes ago, you mentioned leveraging the lake. Um, it's kind of curious to get your take on sort of the growth that's been happening throughout the Finger Lakes around the lakes. Uh, it seems to be the sort of the epicenter of everything good that's happening in the region. Uh, just sort of your take as a city manager of a city, probably looking to harness that a little bit. Well, I, Candagua Lake is is the lifeblood of, of, of the Canandaigua economy, um, and as the Finger Lakes are the lifeblood of our of all the communities in the Finger Lakes. Um, you know, the natural beauty and the recreational activities that they provide us are um, it's just uh, one of those you know, high quality of life things that they provide. Uh, they also, for, for at least the, the Canandaigua Lake, provides drinking water, um, actually the best drinking water in the state, um, as, uh, according to the last taste test. Um, for to over sixty thousand people, um, uh, so you know, we, it's it's vital that we we utilize and, and leverage that lake. Uh, at the same time, we also need to make sure that it's protected. Um, and you know, we even work with our watershed council, which is um, fourteen uh, municipalities throughout the uh, the Canandaigua Lake watershed, uh, to do uh, many projects to protect it uh, through water quality and flooding projects, um, education efforts, um, and so it's it's it's. The lifeblood of our community, we realize that, and um, you know, the north shore of Canandaigua Lake has, is is pretty much the entire city, of, um, you know, uh, southern border, um, and it's all parkland uh, for the most part, which is the most parkland uh, uh, out of any community on Canandaigua Lake. So we 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 know that the the public wants to to uh, enjoy that beauty and enjoy the recreation activities, and uh, we um, want to protect it and, and leverage that the best we can. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, obviously, one of the one of the projects along the lake that has sort of stalled out a little bit, but seems to be getting a little bit of energy pushed back into it, uh, the stalled hotel project. Mm -hmm. uh, give us an update just on where things stand with that. I know a lot of people are curious; they're always sort of wondering what's what's going to happen when it's not changing. Um, but where do things stand right now with that project? Well, you know, it, it, it reminds many people of the Hyatt um, in Rochester, um, which I, I wasn't in the region at the time, but. Um, a similar thing where a hotel is getting built and it's stalled and you have um, what some people call a bird cage or a skeleton hotel. Um, there's a couple of different nicknames for it. Um, but I, I can assure you that the developers have been working you know, very hard to try to get that going again. Um, as they ended up losing their financing when the bank they're using got shut down by the federal government. Um, and That'll do it. Uh huh. That'll do it. That that'll do it. <laughs> um, as and then they had a, a partnership that um, seemed to be going well, and that fell apart. Um, so that accounted for almost a year. Um, but they've been working very hard and getting financing, um, and they are this close. Uh, and, and I know that that's been said before. 
uh, but they really are. We know that because there's been appraisers um, talking to our assessor's office and attorneys getting um, you know documents from from the city. So we know there's financial institutions um, or a financer that is doing the, the due diligence into it. Um, so there, there's that end, and I think they are very close to, um, and hopefully by by Christmas we'll be able to know whether they got that financing or not. Um, then the, uh, the other angle is, is there is a uh, mechanics uh, judgment uh, from a, that results from a mechanics lien, um, and there is a potential foreclosure auction uh, scheduled in early, early next year. Um, so no matter what, something's going to happen there, whether we have uh, financiers uh, financing the current developers, which I think is what will happen, um, and, we'll, and that, that'll be announced you know, by the end of this year, or we'll have new owners based, based on a foreclosure auction. Um, Something's going to happen. Um, the community has wanted a hotel at that site for ever since Roseland uh, Amusement Park closed. Um, you know, there's been approvals of dating back to the, the to the late '80s. Um, so it's going to happen. Uh, and Canandaigua Lake is one of the most expensive lakefront property in in the country. I think it goes back and forth with Lake Tahoe. Um, so it's too valuable to sit like that. Um, it, it will happen. Uh, we have to be more patient than anybody would like, and um, it is uh, an eyesore, but uh, it will get done, and um, I, I hopefully we'll start see construction uh, early next year. Now, let's talk about another one of the, uh, from the uh, from an outsider's perspective, it seems like one of the more impressive uh, feats that have come up in the last uh, few years, Pinnacle North. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, that was a, a big a big moment for Canandaigua, but uh, just curious, did that have the impact that the city was hoping, and what were some of the goals of seeing a project like that happen uh, within its bounds? Well, I think it's important to remember that Pinnacle North, um, only phase one has been complete. Uh, that's a five-phase project. Um, phase two is a mirror image of, of phase one, but on the other side of the street that they constructed. Um, but you can definitely uh, already see some of the fruits uh, starting to, to come out of that project. Um, uh, even more activity on the lakefront than you know there normally is. Um, with, with the brewery and the ice cream uh, place, and now there's a salon down there, um, and now they've gotten at least up to about 90 percent, at least um, and so the 90 percent occupied, which took a little bit um, a, a time to get that going. Um, but you know, so th- those fruits are going to start to to bear for us. Um, and as that project continues, the the it will continue to bear more fruit and. Um, and the other thing is, is that was a brownfield. Um, uh, many people forget that. You know, if you ask some lo- some uh, long timers, they'll say that used to be the dump land. Um, you know, so uh, so the project included, you know, cleaning up that brownfield. Um, you know, unlike many of the towns around us, you know, we don't have green fields uh, to develop, which are you know undeve- you know easy. You just plop up a new new development, no no cleanup. Um, many of the redevelopments that are going on in the city involve some kind of cleanup uh, based on some past action, and this uh, was no exception. Uh, now, of course, one of the other uh, more recent uh, developments, uh, Nolan's, the restaurant is getting rebuilt. A lot of people are excited about that. Uh, some federal grant money is coming to help out with that. Mm-hmm. How big is it to see that money, the federal money, come back, the grant money come back into a city like Canandaigua? Oh, well, first, I'll take any grant that um, <laughs> whether the state or federal government wants to throw our way uh, that we can help spend on, on our community, uh, whether it be restaurant or infrastructure or what have you. Um, you know, so it's going to ultimately help the, the city economy. Um, one of the uh, we've been talking about leveraging the lake. You know, uh, some people will, will will bring their bag lunch and just sit at the pier and just stare at the lake for, during their lunch hour. Uh, well, Nolan, Nolan's is right there. Uh, they're mm-hmm. going to have plenty of, of expanded outdoor seating, uh, expanded event space, um, so we can bring you know bring larger groups into the city to to eat, and, and then after they eat there, they're going to explore the rest of the city, and there's going to be all kinds of uh, benefits for it. Um, so and it and if we didn't get the grant money, it would go to another community. Um, right. So uh, we'll you know if if it's out there, we'll 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 pursue it and um, and you know it'll be the for the long term benefit of the community. Does that ever get frustrating? The the idea that you know some people, no matter what, will be they'll say, oh my God, this is tax dollars being spent, blah 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 blah. But if that money isn't being spent, 
in Canandaigua. It's going to be spent somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Uh, is, does it ever get frustrating just having to sort of pound on that over and over again? It's coming here. It's being spent here. It's going to be spent somewhere, but at least it's being spent here. Well, I, I understand the, the the sentiment that people have. Uh, you know, well, you're you're taking our taxpayer dollars and you're giving it to, for a private benefit, and I, I understand uh, where they're coming from. Um, but as you said, if it's if it's out there and the federal or the state government's giving it away, I'm going to try to get it for our community. Right. Um, but I, I've I've told the city council, and I'll still argue that the best thing we can do for economic development is to do what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, and making sure the sidewalks are maintained, the streets are plowed, our parks are, are in good condition. Um, so when you drive in downtown Canandaigua and you see the beautiful flowers and the American flags fl- flowing and you, you look around and you say, wow, I want to be here, um, that's the best thing that we can do for economic development. Um, um, but if the grants are out there to, to, to get, to, to help even further, um, we're going to try to do it. So Canandaigua has probably one of the more impressive uh, main streets in the entire Finger Lakes. Uh, it seems to be mostly full, always busy, vibrant, uh, well taken care of. Uh, what do you attribute that to, and how important is that main street success for the city? Uh, well, first of all, I, I love downtown Canada. Well, and, um, and if you drive through some other upstate cities, um, and you say, wow, if you really learn to appreciate what we have even more. Um, and sometimes people in the community can forget that we we have a, a beautiful main street um, and part of that is we have a partnership with our, our business improvement district um, uh, Denise Chapel is our director does a fantastic job getting feet on the street with all kinds of events and, uh, and, and initiatives uh, out there uh, and we try to recruit businesses that will fit um, and we work really hard to, to, to maintain it um, so I, I think you know it's it's really the community support um, uh, of Main Street that makes it what it is, um, and we're we're lucky to have some fantastic restaurants. I say you can eat the world in downtown Canandaigua. Uh, we have a, a, a wonderful new Thai restaurant. Uh, you can get Indian uh, food, the best Mexican you ever had, uh, Italian, American pub food, German, okay. uh, you know, simply crips. The, you know, there's there's all kinds of uh, different food varieties, and it's all fantastic. Um, so that also brings a, a cultural and social scene to our downtown. Um, which you know then spreads to the to the niche retail we have, um, so I, I think we have a fantastic downtown because we have a community that supports it, and we have people working hard to to keep it that way. Mm-hmm. Now a couple more questions before we get you out of here, and these are just sort of uh, parting shots on some changes that are going to be coming to the region. Obviously, um, Assemblyman Brian Kolb, uh announced that he is running for governor. Obviously, would be a big change for uh, Ontario County. Uh, just sort of your take as city manager in Canandaigua on what that could possibly mean, either him with him winning or with new representation in assembly um, for the city. Well, first, uh, I, I, I mentioned that I'm a public administrator. I'm, I'm a member of ICMA, um, and our ethics is uh, we have to be apolitical. Uh, so I'm registered to vote, but I'm not registered to any party. Um, uh, and if I can have a conversation with, with, with someone and you don't know where I land on the ideological thing, then I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, and, and, and hopefully uh, people will guess either way, and I'm, that means I'm doing something right. Um, so I, I won't comment on, on any of that, but, um, but I, I obviously, you know, when you, you know, your local assemblyman uh, runs for governor, it, it's going to have an impact on, on, our, on the area, and um, Brian's done a fantastic job uh, representing the candidate community, and we uh, wish him luck, but... Um, you know that that's for the voters in New York to decide, and uh, and I'll and I'll cast my vote in private, and let the, the the voters of the state to decide how they they want to vote. And of course, the exit of uh, Geneva City Manager Matt Horn. Obviously, I'm sure being two city managers in the same county, you've uh, discussed over over the years about various parts of the job. Uh, were you surprised when you heard the news that he was uh, going to be leaving the city of Geneva? Yeah, that that was, it did catch me by surprise. And, um, and Matt and I have worked a little closely. Uh, we, we actually have some NICOM awarding projects together. Uh, we share our IT department and we share assess, an assessor. Um, as we talked earlier, we're always looking for ways to be more efficient and effective and provide the same level of services. And uh, the city of Geneva has helped the Canandaigua and vice versa to do that. Um, so it, it did catch me by surprise that Matt was leaving. And um, I haven't been able to talk to him uh, in person yet, but... Um, I wish him luck, and um, and, and hopefully the, the city of Geneva can uh, get somebody that uh, can get to that level, but it will be tough tough shoes to fill. Yeah. All 
All right. Well, I really appreciate you coming in, and obviously, best of luck continuing with your job. Obviously, uh, doing a great job so far, and best of luck. Well, thanks, Josh. Anytime. Yeah. That's going to do it for us today. I'd like to thank John, our listeners, and of course, FingerLakes1.com for making this podcast possible. Inside the FLX airs Sundays at 7 p.m. on Spectrum Channel 12 and is available on iTunes, Stitcher, and the FingerLakes1.com app. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you next time. Thank you.